Good afternoon, and uh, let me first of all thank uh, the organizers for having me here and uh, have the opportunity to address uh, such a distinguished audience. I, I was given this uh, title for my presentation and uh, I'm happy to, to talk about these issues. I should say that um, I am the only presenter today that has no prior connections with Korea, either scholarly or personal. And I'm also the only lawyer. I, lawyer, I hope that will lower your expectations. <laughs> so first of all, uh, we, I will give you some examples of European scandals, and then I will talk you a little bit about uh, what uh, Italy did after uh, its uh, main uh, corporate scandals back in the 2000s. There were some minor sc scandals uh, uh, Asian-driven in the UK as well, and the UK also reformed its uh, regime to take care of that, uh, of the problems that uh, 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 were made uh, clear from those uh, scandals. I will also tell you a little bit about uh, some prospective rules that will enter into force in two years in Europe, and I will then uh, conclude. So, uh, first of all, uh, a few words about uh, European scandals. Um, the famous quote by Lev Tolso is that happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. I would say that for uh, uh, cor of corporations and corporate governance, the opposite is true. So every successful company is different, but every scandal is alike. You, you basically tell uh, false information to, to the market to hide your mismanagement. And in the process, you steal as much as possible because you know that uh, time is limited to do that because sooner or later, reality will catch up with you. And uh, so the, the, the most uh, infamous European scandal from the 2000s, unfortunately, took place uh, in Italy, the country where I am from, and it's the uh, Parmalat uh, scandal. This was a pretty straightforward case of a company that uh, went public in 1989 with uh, accounts that were already false. It did so via a reverse merger, so there was never a prospectus because it, it, the, the unlisted company merged with uh, a listed company which had no remaining business, basically it was, it was almost bankrupt, but the, it, it had a value as a listed company because you could go uh, public without the cost of an IPO. And then it went on uh, giving false information to the market, uh, uh, claiming to have assets that it, it never had, and uh, it engaged in a, in a, in a, in a serial acquisitions that's also a common feature of a scandal that you have companies that buy new firms every, every year or so, which also makes uh, com, com, uh, understanding how well the company is doing harder. And, and the, the, the techniques to, ha to, to, to hide reality were, were, were pretty uh, 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 standard and uh, the, the, they also forged, forged bank documents towards the end the, there was a, a document uh, with the, the letterhead of Bank of America that stated that Parmalat had uh, uh, 3.4 billion in cash at Bank of America that was forged with a, with a photocopy machine in uh, Collecchio Parma, Italy. And, and, and so that went on for uh, basically 13 years until the reality ca came out and, and the, it was one of the largest uh, bankruptcies in, in Italy, and uh, the, the family took out uh, a, a part of the, at, at least three billion of what it got from, from markets, uh, from um, um, minority shareholders, and, uh, and from uh, uh, credit, uh, creditors. So, so th this is a relatively well-known scandal. I would like to tell you another, uh, the story of another scandal which I, I, fi I find uh, more uh, uh, fun, at least. Uh, 
Uh, this is the story of this uh, gentleman on the right who, who is pictured here with uh, Callisto Tanzi, who was the um, dominant shareholder at Parmalat. But his name is uh, Sergio Cragnotti. He was the CFO of a joint venture between the Italian state and the, the largest uh, chemical company. There, there was a, a bribe that was paid uh, at some point uh, in order for the private uh, company to take over the joint venture, which was known as the mother of all bribes because it was very big. And he was, in, of course, uh, uh, part of, the, uh, of the, the, the crime, but he confessed and implicated others and therefore avoided jail. And while he was doing that, he, he, he also was disqualified as a director in Canada and banned from being a member of Canadian stock exchanges because he had uh, manipulated the commodities markets back in the 80s while he, he was uh, a manager at the, the company that later became the chemical uh, company involved in Animont. Despite all this, he founded a, a closed and collective investment company in Ireland which in turn founded a, a, a holding company in Luxembourg. He put in, the, the, his holding company from Ireland put in 33% of the shares, but it got majority, a majority of the voting rights. And it, he took in uh, some business partners, among them many Italian banks and uh, Swiss banks. And uh, we, with that money, he started uh, buying uh, per, uh, companies. And uh, he, he used it as a leverage vehicle. He, he first bought a dairy company from a distressed uh, state-owned firm. And then he bought uh, Cirio, which is a, a, an Italian food company. He, he bought uh, a Brazilian company known as Bombril. Uh, an Italian football team, Lazio, Del Monte Europe, which is into food, and uh, Centrale del Latte di Roma, which is another dairy company. And, um, and he did so using a lot of, lots of debt. And throughout the years, uh, the creditors and the shareholders at, at the higher level became uh, ner nervous because they were seeing that not, not enough cash was generated by this uh, uh, conglomerate uh, group, and therefore they started to put pressure on uh, Cragnotti to have their money back. So th this was the structure of the group of the be very beginning, not, not really a pyramid, if you, if you look at it. There, there is, of course, CMP Ireland and CMP Luxembourg, but uh, then all the companies are directly controlled by CMP Luxembourg, and two of them are listed, Cirio and Bombrin. Cirial in Italy and Bombrin in Brazil. So what does uh, Cragnotti do to solve uh, his uh, fellow shareholders and uh, problems and the creditors? Well, he uh, basically starts moving these holdings around. So first of all, he sells uh, the, the stake in Polenghi to Cirio for 144 million euro which, of course, go up to uh, CMP Luxembourg. And uh, then uh, he sells the C Cirio stake to Bombril, so that another, almost another 400 million euros go, go up. Uh, and, he, of course, he does this uh, uh, through, through, throughout time. So it's, here it looks like it, it, it's all concentrated, but it took three years before he, he made this uh, uh, additional move of moving Cirio to uh, below Bombril, and of course he did that with the help of investment bankers who provided him with uh, very good uh, uh, justification, business justifications for these moves. They, they argued that there would be synergies and, uh, and all that stuff, and, and it was done uh, uh, totally uh, in, in the open, of course. It was, nothing was hidden. Um, then uh, Bombril, the listed company, even underwrote shares in the vehicle in Luxembourg, and uh, uh, CMP sold the Lazio to Cirio uh, in the same uh, year. And two years later, 
the uh, Bombril sold uh, Chirio, the Chirio stake to Craniotian Partners Luxembourg for uh, almost uh, 400 million, but it di that did uh, so on credit other f than for one tenth. Uh, the, the, the reason for the rationale for this uh, transaction from the point of view of CMP was that they therefore could use uh, shares uh, in Chirio uh, as a uh, uh, pledge to I Italian banks, we, which apparently didn't want Brazilian shares uh, as, a, as a pledge. Then uh, Lazio, was, uh, the football team, was listed, and uh, uh, in the same, uh, uh, at the same time, more or less, uh, uh, Cragnotten Partners sold Bombril to Cirio, uh, and um, and that was more or less uh, the, the end of the story. I mean, it, it, what that meant is that almost one billion euro went from the lower tiers of the pyramid up, and, uh, and, and therefore the, the creditors up there and the shareholders were, were very happy, but unfortunately down uh, in, in the, at the lower level something had gone wrong, and in 2002, Chirio went bankrupt, and at the time there were no longer any banks which were creditors of Chirio. The Chirio had issued bonds to retail investors, and they were those who suffered from this uh, uh, demise. So, uh, so th th this is the, the, the Italian. Uh, th these are the two Italian examples. But um, I also wanted to give you some. Uh, examples from other countries, and what I found actually uh, as interesting were cases from, in a way, the UK. So, uh, as you may know, the London Stock Exchange uh, started actively competing for listings in the 2000s, and as, a, as an outcome, a number of Asian and Russian companies listed on the London Stock Exchange. And as, as, it, uh, as it is intuitive, most of them had and still have controlling shareholders who are used in their own jurisdictions to uh, run their companies as though they are uh, their own. And um, one would think that the UK should have rules in place that uh, may effectively deal with the temptation for uh, dominant shareholders to treat uh, uh, their companies as exclusively their own. So, for example, uh, in the UK, there are rules that require majority of the minority approval for large uh, transactions with related parties. There are strongly enforced preemption rights, at least for UK companies. But, but the truth is that um, it's hard to devise a system, even with a good tradition of corporate law, that is tunneling proof because there are many different ways of engaging in tunneling and, and tunneling. And, and if you are a dominant shareholder, you, you will find the way which has the least effective legal checks. And in fact, it is also the case that the UK had not been used as a system to deal with controlling shareholders because companies had been widely held there for many decades. They, they, they had these rules in place, the listing rules. They, they also have a corporate governance code based on the comply or explain principles, which grants a, a lot of uh, uh, power within corporations to independent directors who are a majority. Uh, in, in UK companies, but that, of course, has much uh, less relevance if you have a dominant shareholder. So what the UK found out after inviting all these uh, uh, Asian and Russian companies uh, in was that their rules weren't that effective uh, uh, in dealing with these uh, sort of uh, companies. So uh, we, we, there were a number of uh, cases uh, like, for example, Boomi, which uh, listed as a special purpose acquisition vehicle sponsored by a Rothschild, uh, which had the idea of combining the high standards of uh, UK governance with undervalued uh, assets in East Asia. So he bought a majority stake in a, 
in, in an Indonesian mining company, and that was the mistake, a minority stake in another Indonesian company, and the dominant uh, shareholder of which also bought a controlling stake in the uh, special purpose acquisition but in, in, the, in the listed company, the UK listed company, and therefore became dominant, uh, which led to the, the, um, uh, the dominant shareholders basically uh, doing uh, uh, the wrong thing, uh, that is uh, engaging in related parties uh, transaction with, with its own uh, control subsidiary, uh, we, which in turn led to uh, serious uh, uh, depreciation of, of the shares and, and uh, it was the first case in which the, the UK realized that maybe their rules were not that uh, good in dealing with uh, companies with dominant shareholders. The second case was uh, um, ENRC, which was controlled by three Kazaki oligarchs who incorporated their company as a UK company and started with a majority independent board to show that they had serious intentions. But then when they saw that the independent directors were doing their job and trying to curb uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the majority shareholders' tendency to, to basically go on with their own practices of related party transactions, they uh, what they did was uh, to refuse to give their vote to renew two of the most prominent independent directors uh, and they, they, they also had this um, uh, statement for, for the press that there is no shortage of English lords to go on boards in the UK and the, the, one of the two board members uh, that were not renewed uh, uh, said to, to the press that uh, what he had experienced in that company was more Soviet than city. And the, the outcome of, of this was that uh, ENRC decided to buy out the minority at a, at a deep discount compared to the IPO price, which, uh, which is one of the many ways you, you can basically rip off minority shareholders. Uh, a third case was ESSER, very similar. Um, in that case as well, the, the, when the price uh, of the shares went down, the dominant shareholders bought out minorities uh, at a, a very low price, which is uh, something uh, that, uh, of course, uh, um, the, the UK uh, press uh, stigmatized as, as wrong. So these, these are uh, just a few examples of uh, European, so to speak, corporate scandals. Now I, I will turn to how Italy and the UK reacted to, to these uh, scandals and, and, and more generally how they reformed their company laws. So Italian cor corporate law is traditionally very much pro-insiders. Uh, the SEC concept was only established in 1974 and wasn't very powerful until uh, arguably the, the, the 90s or possibly later. Uh, there was some mod modernization of corporate law in, in the years from 1985 to 1992 when a number of uh, European directives, especially in the field of securities regulation, were implemented and then in 1992, the government had to privatize some of its assets because uh, the, the public debt was too high back then already. And, and so it did so by also enacting a new law which uh, specifically applied only to privatized companies uh, and which was uh, um, more protective of minority shareholder interest than the general law. Uh, in an example of what later Gilson, uh, Hansman, and uh, uh, Park Gendler called uh, regulatory dualism. You, you enact new rules that do not uh, apply to the incumbents, uh, which makes uh, the enactment of these rules easier. And, and so importantly, one thing that was decided that was that the minority shareholders would have representation in the boards of privatized companies. The, the number changed one company, uh, depending on the number of board seats, but it was more or less three seats for normal sized boards. 
and, uh, and that uh, was, uh, as I will also sh uh, argue later, quite an important innovation. In 1998, uh, there was an, another overall of uh, uh, listed companies uh, uh, law. There were new minority shareholder powers that were introduced. For example, one board of auditors members had to be appointed by minorities. The derivative suit was introduced, but the threshold was too high to make it meaningful. Importantly, a blocking minority for charter amendments was introduced at two thirds. Uh, but, but the problem was that it, these new rules uh, were uh, very weak on conflicts of interest, and there was nothing on a related party transaction back then. Uh, one year later, the Italian Corporate Governance Code was introduced. One would have uh, thought that given the weakness in the law about related party transaction, there would be something in the Corporate Governance Code at least. Nothing was there and, until five years later when some uh, quite uh, lenient rules were at least uh, present, uh, introduced uh, on, uh, on related party transactions. Um, then uh, there was a, quite a setback for reformers in Italy in 2003. We had uh, a government uh, chaired by Mr. Berlusconi, whom you may have heard of, and he had problems with uh, justice. Uh, he was in, indicted for uh, actually false accounting. So just before Warcom and Parmalat and Cirio uh, happened, he uh, managed to water down conflict of interest rules in, in Italian uh, corporate law, general corporate law, and he also made uh, accounting fraud practically um, impossible to punish. Uh, and in fact, he was acquitted uh, later uh, for uh, his, uh, in his, his trial. But then uh, Parmalat came and, and Cirio came uh, and another uh, banking scandal in Italy that led to uh, the approval, the enactment of a so-called protection of savings law uh, at the same time uh, when uh, the, a directive from the European Union, the market abuse directive also was implemented, a directive which uh, 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 dealt with uh, insider trading and market manipulation. So, what the new protection of savings law did was to extend the rules on uh, minority shareholder representation on the board to all listed companies. And, and that was an important uh, change. It's only one director, but uh, arguably uh, it made a difference uh, in some of the uh, companies, at least uh, the anecdotal evidence is that there have been quite a few cases, whether in privatized firms or in private firms, where uh, the representative of the minority either resigned and made it clear vocally that something was wrong at the company, for example, with Telecom Italia back in the 2000s, or in the, uh, we, we've had some prominent uh, Italian US-based uh, finance professors who had uh, uh, been appointed by minority shareholders who took their job very seriously because their, uh, their reputation as finance professor was at, at stake and therefore were really, really tough in, in many occasions. One is Luigi Zingales and the other is Paola Sapienza who still sits in the board of the largest insurance company and uh, had uh, to to work uh, hard uh, in many cases in which uh, members of the board uh, had uh, uh, tried to enter into transactions with uh, the company. Uh, in addition to that, uh, with the implementation of the market abuse directive, Italy decided to, to do something more than was required by the directive by requiring that uh, any trading by controlling shareholders and not just managers as the market abuse directive required uh, had to be uh, disclosed. And uh, the concept's powers were strengthened. And uh, back then, more or less, uh, there was a delegation of power to the Italian securities regulator to enact rules on related party transactions, which CONSOP did in 2010. I, I should disclose that um, uh, in the last uh, 
almost 20 years, uh, 20 years, I, I've been uh, an advisor first to the, uh, well, first an employee at the Bank of Italy, then an advisor to the Italian Ministry of the Economy, then a commissioner at the, the Italian Securities Regulator, and whether uh, in, in, I, in any of these capacities I have advised the government in these uh, issues. So I may be over positive about uh, the, 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 the good quality and the good effects of these, uh, um, these regulations. And, uh, specifically, I, I, I can uh, immodestly say, or modestly if you don't like it, that uh, the 2010 regulation on related party transaction is... Uh, uh, a brainchild of mine. I, I wouldn't have written as it is if I had been uh, omnipotent and could decide everything, but, uh, but still uh, the outcome is pretty much close to what uh, I had uh, designed in the first place. So in 2011, Italy implemented the Shareholder Rights Directive, which facilitated voting, and uh, it, uh, it did so also by extending the period in which annual meetings uh, uh, have to be held, because there was a 30th of April deadline, which was extended to June, and that uh, helped in uh, reducing the problem that Professor Park uh, highlighted you have here in Korea of having all the meetings in the same uh, Fridays. Nowadays, Italy has moved to, to away from that uh, practice, thanks also to this change in the law. And finally, the, this law prohibited share deposits so that institutional investors don't have to, uh, to deposit their, their shares for five days if they want to vote, as it used to be the case uh, in Italy and in other European uh, countries. So uh, a few words about the 2010 re regulated party transaction re uh, regulation. Um, this, these rules, uh, for the first time, introduced decent rules on related party transactions. The, 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 the re main requirement in terms of process was that for uh, larger transactions, independent directors or a committee thereof had a veto over these transactions. And if you couple that with the minority shareholder representation and if the minority shareholder representatives on the board are, are uh, good enough at, at doing their job, they may end up in the committee and, and have a say over the, the transaction. It's not automatic. You can have uh, minority sh uh, shareholder rep representatives who will not be in the committee, so that, that's a problem, but, uh, but um, I we have evidence that it's relatively often the case that they are in, in these committees. And in, in addition to this procedural uh, requirement, uh, it is now the case that uh, immediate and detailed disclosure, again, on material related party transaction has to be provided to the public. The, 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 what is not as effective as it could be is that uh, you have to disclose after the transaction has been approved, while we have seen that when companies uh, had to disclose uh, a related party transaction earlier than that, for example, because of general disclosure obligation rules that apply to, um, for example, merger transactions, then that, was that had a very positive impact on how the transaction was entered into because there was a press coverage and institutional investor pressure on what the terms of the transaction would be, and we have seen that the terms have improved following this external pressure. The, the rules are, are uh, such that uh, they have to be implemented through an internal code by boards of directors at individual companies, and uh, there are a number of uh, uh, opt-ups and opt-downs that they can choose. So the, the, mo many of the rules are, are uh, not the ones I have mentioned, but the, some of the details are default rules that companies may improve on or go sl slightly worse with, with a floor, of course, that is provided by the uh, regulation. 
And, and finally, the new uh, ru the rules were uh, uh, provided for a more lenient regime for smaller cap companies and for newly listed companies, not because newly listed companies uh, are uh, less prone to, to uh, tunneling, uh, and that's also the case for smaller companies, but, uh, but because the, there was a strong uh, uh, a, a strong voice against harsh rules because they would basically um, freeze uh, IPOs. People would not be willing to list anymore if the rules were, were too harsh. So, so the idea was that they could uh, get used to being listed uh, by having to deal f first for three years with the less harsh rules, which uh, basically provide for uh, independent directors non-binding uh, vote on the uh, transaction, uh, non-binding opinion on the transaction. What did the UK do after these East Asian uh, scandals? They enacted an enhanced uh, listing regime which deals specifically with uh, control companies. And so first of all, if there is a controlling shareholder for a company listed on the UK stock exchange with a premium listing, uh, there has to be an agreement between the controller and the company by which the controller commits to respecting the independence of the company, uh, commits not to have uh, basically an undue influence over the company. And what is interesting is, is the, what the sanction is if this uh, uh, independence uh, agreement uh, is... Uh, uh, not even violated, as we shall see in a second. So if th there is a, a, a finding of a violation of this agreement, or even if uh, one independent director declares, states that the agreement has been violated without uh, any in inquiry into whether he, is, he or she is right or wrong, then the sanction is that each and any related party transaction, no matter its size or no matter whether it's ordinary and, uh, and routine, will be subject to majority of the minority approval of the shareholders. And f finally, the minority shareholders have to approve uh, the independent directors th that uh, um, the dominant shareholder or the company itself will uh, uh, nominate. But uh, that's not uh, really binding because uh, if uh, the majority of the minority say that they don't like the appointees, then uh, the only thing that happens is that there will be a window of 90 days in which the, the idea is that uh, the, the dominant shareholder may change its mind and, and uh, uh, propose uh, other directors that the minorities will uh, uh, approve of. If that doesn't happen, however, the dominant shareholder will be able to appoint the same directors uh, uh, with, uh, without uh, any more say for the minority shareholder. So that, that was arguably quite a weak solution. The, there had been uh, proposals to have minority shareholder representation uh, on the board of these companies that the UK Financial Conduct Authority decided not to uh, finally put in the, in the listing rules. And, and there is also no mandated number of independent directors for uh, control companies. The, the corporate governance code provides that a, ma a majority of the independent director uh, of the board has to be composed of independent directors, but that's on a comply or explain basis, so a company can uh, declare that it's not complying with the code and have less than half of the uh, directors that are independent. And that remains true for uh, companies with controlling shareholders. Um, recently, there was a, the, the European Union adopted uh, some amendments to the Directive on Shareholder Rights, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, for what, what might be more of interest here, 
there are new rules uh, that uh, require uh, member states to introduce uh, say on pay, but um, as it often happens in controversial areas, the European Union was unable to impose uh, strong solutions, so it gives member states the option of ha having either a binding or a non-binding vote on the remuneration policy, and, and similarly, it, it, it requires member states to have a non-binding vote on re, uh, the remuneration report. And uh, then uh, there are rules uh, in, the, in this new directive which will have to be implemented by 2019 on related party transactions which uh, originally were very similar to UK rules which require uh, majority of the minority approval for large transactions and disclosures, but in the process of um, adoption of the directive, um, some of the member states were very much against the, uh, the harsh uh, regime that the UK had in place. The UK didn't really bother about what the European Union would decide, and, and so Germany especially uh, pushed for more lenient rules, so now we are left with uh, uh, rules that, uh, first of all, say that uh, material related party transactions have to be disclosed, but m the definition of materiality is not provided by the European Union. It's member states who will decide what it is material. And then there has to be an opinion on the transaction which can be from either an independent third party or the board of directors itself, which is quite weak, as you can imagine. And uh, in addition to that, uh, there has to be approval, but while uh, in the original version it said that the approval had to be from the majority of the minority shareholders, now the approval can be from any organ of the company, any internal body of the company, uh, so long as uh, the procedures prevent the related party from taking advantage of its position and provide adequate protection for the interests of the company and of the shareholders who are not a related party. So a, a very vague uh, guideline to member states. And in addition to that, there are various exemptions, including for routine transactions, as it is, it is often the case. Um, my fear is that the, these rules will uh, um, give uh, an occasion to dominant shareholders in countries which have uh, more stringent rules than this, like Italy, to water down the provisions because we can't have uh, rules in place that are worse than elsewhere uh, because that will make our businesses less competitive. I, I've heard those arguments when we implemented the, the first, uh, the, the concept of regulation. I'm sure they will come up again. So a couple of words uh, about uh, the role uh, of independent directors in approving uh, related party transactions. It, it's not ideal. My, my uh, uh, preferred analog analogy is with aging. It's a very bad thing until you think about the alternative. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, one may argue that ma majority of the minority approval is better, but there are places where that's simply a political non-starter and therefore it's better to have a role for independent directors than nothing, basically. So, so that will work uh, depending on whether companies will uh, indeed uh, appoint as independent directors someone who is really independent, and there is no way to be prescriptive about that because the, the proof of substantial independence is, of course, only in the pudding. It's how they behave that will tell you whether they are really independent. One possibility would be to say that only minority directors should uh, be given the, the right to, the, the power to, to veto transactions, but, but, but that may be uh, too much, again, politically. And uh, there is the issue of uh, how informed independent directors can be. Many argue that someone who is not an executive will not have a clear understanding of the transaction uh, and, and therefore uh, uh, may be unable to understand uh, 
the, the virtues of a related party transaction or even how, how e uh, bad it will be for the company. So, so, so the, the, when uh, independent directors are, are uh, involved in uh, approving individual transactions, they, will, uh, they may lose some objectivity in that they will become closer to the CEO, they will get a lot of information from the CEO, and therefore they may not be as independent as they uh, used to be. But, but, but the counter argument to that is, is that uh, if, they ca if independent directors can meaningfully perform any function, this should be it. I, I can see any other reason why independent directors should, sh uh, any other better reason why independent directors should sit on the board. And these arguments that I have just mentioned apply to anything that independent directors will do within a board. Uh, of course, uh, saying that independent directors are involved doesn't say much because their role can be very different. It can be a non-binding advice on the transaction. It, it can be a majority vote among all uh, independent directors, we, which is not as effective, arguably, as uh, uh, having a, a few of them uh, in charge of the decision, because the, the more people are involved, the, the less each will uh, get informed. Uh, having a binding of advice will be better, although, again, access to information is key, and, and there's the issue of uh, CEOs controlling whatever information independent directors will, will get. And the, arguably, if, if you think that independent directors can play a role, perhaps the US solution of the special committee is the most effective one. There you have these three, four directors who will uh, not only decide on the transactions, but also conduct the negotiations and be in charge of deciding whether to enter the transaction with that counterparty uh, or with another. So they, are, they have total discretion also about alternatives, which is very important. And uh, the, the main alternative to, to independent directors on the, on the side of uh, 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 stringency is uh, the majority of minority approval, and perhaps that is not as effective as it looks on paper. First of all, because uh, you have to have a system that uh, fairly allows all shareholders to take part uh, to, to the shareholder meeting, and there are jurisdictions where that is not necessarily the case. Of course, they, these are very, very bad law jurisdictions, but the, there is anecdotal evidence for Russia, for example, that when the stakes are high, dominant shareholders will, will uh, find ways to exclude minority shareholders from the general meeting. Uh, and then there is the issue of uh, how sincerely independent shareholders will vote. There might be uh, conflicted institutional investors. I, I, I think that sounds familiar in this country. And uh, even identifying who the independent shareholders are may be difficult because there will always be, quote unquote, friends and family of the dominant shareholders with no explicit uh, um, relationship with the related party who may still cast the, their votes uh, and, and the vote with the, the related party. Um, the, the information problem is even uh, more serious with the shareholders. They, they may not be given all the information that is needed to understand how pernicious a transaction is because the company, uh, the CEO, will control the information that they get, and they may not understand fully the implication of the transaction. Uh, and there is the general issue of whether uh, investors can make business as opposed to investment decisions, uh, which may lead to mm, the, the wrong people making important business decisions. And, um, and finally, what uh, is a problem with, uh, with um, mom approval is that uh, the vote may occur too late. That is when uh, the proposed transaction is now the, the least uh, harmful alternative because there's no other way to do something that may be of strategic relevance for the company. And because the, 
if, if it's the management who controls the process until the shareholder meeting, that will often be the case. There, there will be uh, alternatives that will have already been uh, discarded as impossible and so on. I have to close and I will uh, uh, quickly say that uh, after uh, uh, scandals, rules have improved uh, in Italy, in, in the UK and possibly in Europe generally, but the challenge of course of policing tunneling goes far, far beyond the law on the books and, uh, and uh, it is also the case that the law itself, whether on the books or in action, can do that much because uh, unless uh, the, the norm, the, the culture is, is against stealing by dominant shareholders, then uh, tunneling will uh, uh, take place all the same. Thank you.